Hello and welcome. Uh, I'd like to uh, share with you 10 things I learned from the jQuery source. Now, these will be things um, about jQuery, shortcuts, internals, how it actually works, but also a little bit of just techniques that are used internally that are kind of library agnostic and you can use in your own development of JavaScript applications or, or even or specifically jQuery applications. Um, well, let's just get into it. Okay. Um, I mean, the first thing that I want to just bring up is that for a long time, I mean, everyone has this point in their development with jQuery. I wish they considered jQuery this black box. And this black box is this magical box that just works, has this great API, we use it, we don't have to w worry about how it actually works internally. We're not going to look inside the source and figure it out, but I'm here to say if you do, I think, I think you're going to benefit from it. And so, um, well, let's do it. Let's just do it. We're going to dig into it. All right. Uh, I'm going to bump this font size up, but we're going to take a look over here. So what I have up here is this is the jQuery uh, 1.4.2 source. Um, and starting right at the top, uh, we got this little guy. So it's a, it's a function definition, but, but we see that it has a paren right before it. Now, if we go to the very bottom, the very end of this file, we close that function definition. Well, here we have that, that paren that matches that beginning one, which was a little odd. And then, um, and then another pair calling with window. Okay, I'm just gonna bring this over to, to over here so that we can take a look at this in better detail. Woo. All right, here we are. So this guy is basically the same as this guy right here. What it is, is it's a function definition and it immediately calls itself. So um, this has commonly been called a self, uh, self executing anonymous function, also called a self invoking anonymous function. They both work. And now <clears throat> these, these other parens, um, they're optional, technically, like it'll work in every browser without them. And you don't need them. And in fact, um, Crockford's The Good Parts book, highly recommended. Um, <clears throat> He's, he says something like this right here with, with wrapping it around the end. And then you can do that. That's fine, too. All this really has been is, is basically just a um, coding convention. So it's, it's a nice heads up to the other people that are looking at your code when they, when they see that first print that's like, hmm, wait, what? What's up? Something's going on. Something is going on, and, and it basically is that it's going to run itself immediately because that dramatically changes <coughs> how you can view this, how you should view this code. Um, I will point out, I have seen this a little bit, just very infrequently. Um, I hear that Facebook is actually using it. Um, they're using a bang, uh, an exclamation mark right in front of their function definition. And, uh, you know, that works. Um, it, it'd be fine. I mean, you could use, um, well, what else could you use? Mm, I can't think of anything. Oh, you could use a plus. Um, that would be just the same uh, as far as its effect. It would be something weird that says, hey, this is odd, but wouldn't really change how it runs. So this would work too. Anyways, okay, I'm going <coughs> to... What's the point of this? Window undefined. Now, I'm actually just going to blow this up. In addition to this, I've been seeing some other stuff. So this is, I, I tweeted this a while ago. This is everyone's favorite new JavaScript pattern. Um, here we go. Now, uh, so what we're doing is we're just calling our brand new function with some arguments. And we're calling it with this and with this dot document. And this could just be document. It really doesn't, it could go either way. So this, in the global scope, the, this keyword refers to the window. It's the global object. So we're going to call it window when we're inside. Document, we'll just keep calling that document. 
and undefined. So this is fun. Undefined. Um, we're not passing undefined in out here. And because we're not doing that, it is an undefined value when it comes in here. Uh, that's useful because, um, well, I, excuse me, but I like to call this the asshole effect. Um, let's say you had an asshole and he decided to do something like this on your page. And that's not very nice. And you just happen to write this um, JavaScript library and you're expecting things to run correctly and you expect your comparisons to undefined to work correctly. And so when you say if foo equals undefined, you want that to work as expected. In JavaScript, however, commonly in browsers, um, this is totally legit. So if I didn't do this, um, this comparison will be totally off and that's not cool. So what happens is that when we do this, we guarantee that this is an undefined value because there's no definition. There was nothing passed in here. And so it's undefined. And so our comparison inside here is totally safe from the asshole who did that. Edge case, I agree. But in addition to this <coughs> cool fact is that when this stuff is minified, so when you run this through YUI compressor, or Google closure compiler, Basically what happens is that these turn into like short little things. And so all your definitions inside of like document dot get element by ID or whatever it is, um, all of a sudden is much shorter. And so you gain a lot of uh, benefits from a, from a minification standpoint by using a pattern kind of like this and jQuery does as well. Um, in addition, there is a bit of a scope traversal benefit. Um, as far as um, uh, it, when I reference document inside here, it only has to look inside the, the, this local scope because I have a document defined here um, and doesn't have to traverse another step up to the global scope. It's a very small performance enhancement, um, but it does have an effect. And so we'll just kind of take that. Um, it's one of the many advantages to this pattern right here. Um, <clears throat> I will also point out <clears throat> how this sort of pattern can be used for something like asynchronous recursion. You might have heard that set interval is bad. Set interval is bad. Set interval is it's a, he set interval is a jerk. He's like I'm just going to run something every every hundred milliseconds and I don't care what happens and I'm going to do this stuff every time and and do stuff might actually take more than a hundred milliseconds it might but set intervals is going to keep calling it keep calling it every hundred milliseconds so you could actually end up with a situation that you don't really want <clears throat> the alternative to something like this is to do something like this. So we're going to do set up or set timeout. Oh, <laughs> I totally messed this up. All right. We're going to have our self executing on this function. <clears throat> um, there we go. do stuff. Okay. Now this right here, this is, um, I mean, it's similar. Basically what happens is that we immediately execute this function. We go in, we do stuff. And then a hundred milliseconds later, we're going to call arguments.callee. Arguments.callee refers to this function right here. So it's basically going to just call itself all over again. Um, and it'll just keep repeating that again and again. But the cool benefit here is that it waits until do stuff is finished before it actually registers to set time out. So let's say do stuff actually takes over 100 milliseconds. It's fine. It's still going to have this little 100 millisecond pause before it calls itself again. Um, <clears throat> Arguments.callee is actually um, deprecated 
in ECMAScript 5's tricked mode, but we can get around that. All we can use is a named function expression. So we'll call this loopsy loopsy loo. Uh, I would say that it has to be named that, but I'm sure that you'll see right through me. You can name it whatever you want, clearly. Uh, just make sure these match. Um, and then you're safe in ECMAScript 5 strict mode. Um, Either way, it's kind of fast. It's kind of cool. Arguments.cali, um, accessing the arguments object is a little slow. So um, so there's a performance benefit to doing this as well. Um, this also works really well with asynchronous recursion. Um, so I'll have something like Ajax, or I'll do a get. So um, we'll be getting my awesome thing. Totally awesome thing. And then, no, I don't really need to set time out at this point. Yeah. So this is like, you, you want to keep something up to date and you're going to um, continue to, you know, maybe this makes more sense as like an update and then a load. Yeah. So we're just gonna like keep updating this um, again and again, something like that. So asynchronous recursion, it just works. We wait until the callback comes to actually call itself again, so that we're not um, we're not firing it off before it's completed. Cool. All right, let's move on. It's about time. All right, the first thing with uh, looking at the jQuery source here it is, is that when you're looking through it, like you want to look up a method, let's just say no conflict, <clears throat> we're going to just do, we're going to type in no conflict and then a colon. In 90% of the cases, this will find the method that you're looking for. There are a few cases where there are like jQuery.get, jQuery.fn.get, actually extend is a better example. Let's just ignore it. It's you'll find it. No conflict. Ever wonder how it works? No conflict. I don't know. It's, it's like it's like this thing that makes it work well with other libraries, and it's great. But how does it work? Um, its code is pretty small. But what it really does is is it's reverting some stuff that we we set up at the very beginning. So up here, way at the top. <clears throat> the first things, because it self-executes, the first things that jQuery does is, is it defines this guy, and then right here, look, window.jQuery is uh, set into underscore jQuery. So this is just a local variable, underscore jQuery, underscore dollar. These receive the current values of these things. In a brand new page, these are going to be undefined. So this is just going to be setting it to undefined. And that's fine. But let's say that you had move tools on the page already window.dollar will be um, who tools? Uh, window.jQuery, maybe you had an older version of jQuery on the page before you loaded this 1.4.2. So it's gonna store it there. So then when we're looking at no conflict, when you call that, it's basically taking what you had stored there um, and then just restoring that value back to dollar and then it just returns itself. Um, and, and that's really it. So it's just like caching the values at the very beginning in case it needs it. It has no idea if you're ever gonna call no conflict. But if you do, spits it out, but spits it back out to you. All right, jQuery props. Given props to jQuery props because it's sweet. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, so it's like this sweet little dictionary lookup thing. jQuery props is used as a, um, well, it's a dictionary lookup. And, oh, and it's used in the adder method, the ATTR method. <clears throat> so this is the only place it's used, really. Of course, ATTR is used by a number of other methods. So it has its name. It, it, you're like, 
you're either setting or you're getting an attribute and it looks to see if that um, if the name that you're looking for exists in jQuery props and if it is it's gonna use it and if it's not it's just gonna fall back and use whatever you passed in and so what's in there you probably have done this before so you're like oh yeah you know I got my element and oops and I, I want the class and give me the class so that I can do something I don't know I'm gonna like split on something I I don't know but this works this returns the class um, but you might know that the class when stored on the DOM element is actually a class name attribute the for, the for attribute that you write in HTML turns into the HTML for in, um, as far as when it's a DOM attribute. Uh, and so there's a bunch of other ones that are like, that have to be camel case when you access them. And so jQuery basically does this nice little friendly translation. And so you don't have to remember exactly what these are because it exists there for you. So it's really nice. Could we take advantage of this? I think we could. Um, you might be familiar with uh, Way Aria. It's a way to basically, um, it's like a stopgap measure to retrofit and get make Ajax, success, Ajax applications accessible, blah, blah, blah. It's good. You should know it. You should learn it. <clears throat> You're going to have to. Um, but it has all these attributes like um, Aria disabled by. And like, I don't, I don't know what the value is, but whatever. So, but Aria disabled by, like, Boy, oh boy, that's a long string. That's like a lot of typing, right? And if only there was a way that I could take a shortcut so that I didn't have to type as much. Well, jQuery props to the rescue. I'll do square bracket notation. Are right, you disabled by equals? Yeah, see what I'm doing here? Now, anytime that I'm using dollar and jQuery interchange interchangeably, I hope that's fine with you. Anytime that you use ADB, it just basically goes through jQuery props, which now this exists in here, and just maps to that. And so my value, whether I'm setting or I'm getting, um, it will, you know, return the whatever. Kind of cool. Right now, I've never like seen anyone do this. I'm not necessarily recommending that you should. I'm just saying you could, and it would work just fine. All right, <laughs> fade in. Oh my god, totally normal speed. Um, <clears throat> if you use something like fade in or animate, you're probably familiar with slow and then fast, and then there's that one in the middle which is like normal I think or is it regular or is it not so slow but not I don't I don't really know so what does it say in the source speeds mm, let's see jQuery.speeds no speeds let's just search for that ah here it is uh, so slow has a definition fast has a definition and then default speed is underscore default Hmm. Now, if I look, yeah, here we go. So here we are, we're in this speed method, right? And this is a internal method that's used by animate and such. And so it's basically determining how long it's going to animate for. And so it looks to see if the duration that you pass into it, um, is, uh, exists in the speeds, um, like lookup dictionary hash, right? And if it does, it's going to use that. Otherwise, it falls back to default. So like normal, it's not finding normal in there. It's just not finding it and falling back to the default. So how could we take this up a notch? Well, one thing that I've noticed is that uh, let's say you have an animation, you're transitioning like the position of some element uh, in IE six, seven, that animation might not be as smooth as you'll find in other browsers. Um, it might be a little jerky. And jerky animations look bad. Now, uh, there's this cool trick that you can do. 
that I've found that works pretty well, which is basically just double the duration of how long the animation takes. Um, it will take twice as long to do, but it's much more likely that it won't be jerky during that longer dura duration. So let's just have it do that by default. So we're basically going to say, if we're dealing with IE and uh, do, 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 do. oh wow, if we're IE six or IE seven, then so we're just doing a little ternary action here. Then we're going to do um, eight hundred milliseconds. Otherwise, we'll do a default to four hundred milliseconds. So here, yeah, that's about it. And I, I mean, you could even name like. You could augment this and say like that jQuery speeds and then like um, fast open or something like that. Like, so you could define your own speeds, right? So then you could do when you're doing some, um, I don't know, you're gonna fade in fast open and it would use the definition that you've defined here. That would be pretty cool too. Works either way. Uh, bind ready. This is some sweet stuff right here. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. This right here is IE Content Loaded. And IE Content Loaded is a solution um, developed by an Italian hacker named Diego Perini um, that is at the root of jQuery's document.ready method. So when you do a document, that ready and you pass it some awesome function in here um, what is it doing glad you asked <clears throat> so it takes a function and basically it says set all this stuff up I need to watch when for when the page actually is ready to use so that's bind ready for most browsers we have add event listener and the event called DOM content loaded DOM content loaded is exactly the thing that we care about. It's when the DOM has the stuff that we wrote in our HTML, it's ready to go, and we can start mucking with it. So that fires, we're all good. Uh, we will bind to window.load just kind of as a fallback, like it's a just in case kind of thing. Yeah. Anyways, it's there. None of this will be run twice, it's just a fallback. However, if we're not a nice Happy browser. So basically, I six, seven, and eight. We're gonna do something else. First, we're gonna attach to on ready state change. Um, the document has a, a ready state that changes, and um, and it has a state called complete, which is cool. But we can do faster, a little bit faster than that. We're gonna have a fallback for on load. It's gonna happen a long time after all iframes and images. It sucks. But <clears throat> here's where it gets good. Now, if the document element, and so this is like the HTML tag, the HTML element has a method called do scroll on it. We're gonna do the do scroll check. Do scroll check. It's I, do scroll is I believe a proprietary method um, from IE, and it basically says like for any element, is there an ability to scroll this element? Like if there was a scroll bar, is it scrollable? Kind of thing. And what Diego found out is that do scroll will fire will will um, raise an exception if the the document content is not ready yet. And so we use this to our advantage, where we basically wrap it in a try catch, and we just try it. And the first time this happens, probably throw an exception. Excuse me. It goes to this catch, and immediately we're like whatever dude do it all over again go back go back once one millisecond it's like no 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 and then finally at some point do scroll is not going to raise an exception and then oh yeah we're good and so then we kick off all the all the methods that you bound using document ready in here so yeah it's pretty cool i'm gonna get to this guy later because it's like super rad <clears throat> okay. Convenience methods. Now, this is something funny, which is like, 
if you've looked in the API site <clears throat> over in Ajax right here is like shorthand methods, right? And like, I always, for the longest time I was like, why, well, why are these called shorthand methods? We're gonna, we're gonna find out why because it probably doesn't make sense right immediately. I mean, they're nice and they have a really great API and all you do is just pass it like the URL and the callback typically and then that's it. But look at their definitions. They're really just calling jQuery.get and specifying what the data type is. jQuery.get is right here um, and it just does some like argument shifting so that it can handle multiple signatures. But all it's doing is calling jQuery.ajax because jQuery.ajax is like the granddaddy. It's like that I'm the dude who knows everything. I'm the dude that handles whatever weird, crazy case, whatever browser. It starts here, it goes down. Yeah, I got your browsers and your bugs and I will fix all your shit and it will work and here it keeps going. <sighs> okay, it ends there. That's how to do cross-browser Ajax. No big deal. Anyways, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take getScript, the jQuery getScript method, and we're gonna turn it into a browser, uh, a, a, a library agnostic, like a plain old JavaScript get script. <clears throat> and so it'd be something like, we're gonna do something like this, where you just give it a URL, give it a callback, it does that. Now this is useful because um, uh, you might want to write a bookmarklet, and bookmarklets typically have a limit on how many characters you can use, so if you want to do something really complicated, you just want to go get another script that you have hosted somewhere, and then you want to know when that script has finished, um, when you've gotten that script, because you want to do something right when that script has been gotten, right? And that's what the cool, that's how GetScript helps us out. So let's get GetScript. Here we go. It's kind of nice and self-contained here, but we're gonna, gonna mess with it a bit. All right, let's turn this into our method instead. All right, so URL callback, sweet. Don't need this if statement because we are already doing this. It's good. Now. We're going to get the head of the document or the HTML element. Hypothetically, we can just do this. It'll still work. <clears throat> I prefer the comma approach. It's much more sexy. All right, here we are. We're setting the script source to the URL. We want it to be the URL that we passed in here. Okay, car set, don't care. If Jason P don't care, go away. All right, now we got this little done false, done true stuff. We want to do that because we don't want this stuff to happen twice. Um, so here, what we're doing is we're binding the handler to both on ready state change and on load, and so that way, inside of it, we check and see if it's coming from an on ready state change. If it is, we check some other stuff. If it's not, we just let it go through. And then if it gets inside here, the script is loaded. So we're gonna call our callback. There's this memory leak something, that's cool. And then here's where we actually attach that script to the DOM. We're attaching it right before the head, which is right up here, and that's cool. Return undefined. That's so boring. Return that jQuery screencasts are the best. Lol. <coughs> yeah. That seems more appropriate. Okay. Oops. Whoa. Whoa. All right. So I think that's good. Let's, let's test it. We're gonna get a script and run a callback. I have an idea. Yep. 
Yep. Yep. I'm going there. Now, first we're going to need to mm, I need a number audience participation. Uh, I need a number between 20 and 80. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Um, okay, I heard 42 and I heard 18. That's not in, no, no, that's outside the bounds. Rule breaker. 75, I like this. 50, uh huh, and 62. Two. Good. Okay. Um, and now um, times equals times oops let's see I forget how to do this <clears throat> math dot random and then we do a math dot floor yeah <laughs> this is totally gonna work right psh, psh. yeah while do, do, times <sighs> yeah it's good right so we're gonna loop I'm not even putting brackets in here because whatever <laughs> F brackets and we're gonna do it one of those amounts of times okay yeah I feel good about this and let's um Let's have some fun right here with the jQuery API site. Yeah. All right. First, get script. Yes. Hello. Beautiful. Ah. Oh. Can we? Yeah. All right. Now, let's call it. Oh, it's good. It's good. Oh, look at <laughs> amazing shorthand methods. Glittery jQuery API. That's oh man. Lovely jQuery API. Ah, <sighs> it really does not get better than Cornify. I the world has yet to create a better piece of JavaScript than Cornify. I just please I I, I welcome the challenge. Wow. Okay. Ah, it's good. Copyright Paul Irish. License. Wherever the fuck you want to license. <clears throat> okay. We're not doing that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about selector performance. Selector performance gets uh, a lot of attention. I don't think it deserves that much attention. Most of the time, selectors don't matter. I mean, like, you can optimize, but really in the greater picture of, like, your, your web application, it's not that big of a deal. The one case that I think that writing very effective selectors is a big deal is when you're doing it with event delegation. So, like, either the live or the delegate method. Um, you want to be using a selector that is fast. Um, and I do recommend that uh, you check out paulirish.com slash perf um, where I have a whole like 10 slides or so on how to make fast selectors. Um, it's somewhere in there. <clears throat> but yeah, they, they matter a lot in event delegation because they get checked on like, let's say you're binding and you're delegating with click and every time you click that selector is evaluated basically like I don't know somewhere between 10 and 20 times each click so you want those to be fast <clears throat> okay um, one cool thing that I'm going to show you is uh, the difference between ID and this guy let's see so you see where I'm getting at so maybe this is a id find tag thing. 
Now, if you've already paused the screencast and went and read those slides, you would have found out that this one is faster than this one. Why is that? We're going to look at the source. Um, the short of it is that this has to be evaluated within sizzle, whereas this does not. Up at the top of jQuery, so we're up at the very top, we have this quick expression. And it basically looks for if you passed in two different things, an HTML string or an ID string. And so we can actually see the ID string is right here. We have the start, the end, and then stuff right after a hash. It's an ID string. And so quick exp is used right down here. And basically here it is if the result if there's a result, we use get element by ID and some other stuff. But this happens very, like, there's like three if statements that it actually hits before it goes there. It's way at the top of jQuery. Um, now, alternatively, if your selector looks something like this, then that quick expression um, is not matched. And so it'll go down into the find method, uh, which then calls sizzle. <sighs> now, I would love to explain to you how sizzle works, but honestly, I never will. Ugh. I've studied it a lot and I just, I'm not, it's not for me. Um, anyways, it, it has an optimization inside here. I found it before, I just can't find it now. Um, it has an optimization to identify if the first thing is an ID. And if it is an ID, then it basically does this sort of thing um, on its own. But it's, it's already taken a while to get into Sizzle. So um, if you do a, you know, a performance test that you're evaluating this one versus this one, uh, this one will be um, probably an order of magnitude faster than that. <clears throat> Just, there you go. The other thing, um, these selector filters, so password um, is a good one. Here they all are. Now, one thing that I noticed when I looked in here was that all these are, like password is, all it does is it checks to see, it gets, it gets handed an element and it looks to see if the element type is password. And that's it. So let's say you had the selector, and this is all that we know that password does. We can then come to the conclusion that it has to evaluate every single element in the document against this little filter here. So it's the exact same thing as the universal selector. It checks every single element against this rule. It'd be a lot faster to just specify the input tag uh, as the tag name here, and then it already limits it by quite a bit. It'll be much faster. So if you can do that um, with any of these selector filters, um, please do specify the tag name uh, instead of leaving it, you know, a blank situation. I mean, this is the same deal with like this or or that. Um, better to qualify. Okay. <clears throat> Parse JSON. So this is a rad little method, and this came in, and I think 1.4.1. Um, here we are. And so parse JSON is used internally um, after you do a get JSON, um, and but it's exposed, especially for plugin developers, um, for a nice way to um, parse JSON. But the cool thing that what it does now, as of 1.4 is that it uses native JSON parsing. So we have native JSON in, in, in IE8, and we have it in um, Chrome and Safari and Firefox as of 3.5. And it's really fast and it's really good. <clears throat> um, so the cool thing that what, what this method does is right in here, basically, the, the data that you pass it, it comes in as a string, and we run this regular expression against it. And it basically says, is this like legit um, JSON, like there should not be dates and there should not be functions. Um, it, those aren't legal JSON. So this basically makes sure that we're dealing with totally legal things. Otherwise, we're going to like throw an error. If what we're dealing with is totally cool, 
we're gonna do this. So I'm gonna bring this over for us to dig into. <clears throat> Here we are. Return, so window JSON and window JSON parse. This is if we have native JSON support, then we're gonna use it. About it. Otherwise, we're gonna do this. This guy is so mad cool. <clears throat> so, new function. So this is the function constructor, right? Capital F. The function constructor takes a string and um, returns a function. And so what happens is it takes this string of uh, return data. At this point, we have a function that's content is is the string that we passed in plus a return so that we know that when we execute this function, and we're using the, the paren technique that we discussed earlier, when we execute it or invoke it or whatever, um, this will then return over, you know, whatever, the um, an object because we've just turned a string into an object. And so, yeah. It's pretty rad. And so this is actually the same um, general basic idea as this. Uh, da, 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 da. You might have seen something like that before. And this is, is similar to that um, in what it what it is actually doing. Um, but it avoids eval, which we know to be an evil thing. Um, it also, eval has access to the local scope where I believe this does not. Um, and, you know, cool points. Totally cooler. Totally not cool. So, I mean, this is Jake right here, right? All right. Unique. Exhale. Man. Here I was. Lonely Wednesday working and I had an array and that array had stuff in it and it had some things that repeat again and again and I was like if only there was a method that could reduce the duplicates in my array. Oh wait, doesn't jQuery have a method called jQuery unique? Oh, what's it say? <clears throat> Sorts an array of DOM elements in place with the duplicates removed. Note this only works on arrays of DOM elements, not strings or what? And I was like, this, you are kidding me. Why is this even in jQuery if it's so useless? Not cool. So here's why it's in jQuery. Unique. Because jQuery unique is just stealing unique sort from sizzle. So it's like a sizzle thing. And sizzle, of course, needs to reduce duplicate elements. And that's, that's fine. But I was like, we need to give this an upgrade. So what we do is we're gonna use something called a duck punch. <clears throat> a duck punch. Um, so since there's this, you know, there's duck typing, you know, when you, when you get passed in something and you try and figure out what it is. Since there's duck typing, uh, well, let's let me just read this. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck, right? So if this duck is not giving the, you the noise that you want, you've got to punch that duck until it returns what you expect. Yeah. So that's what we do. So basically, we're going to redefine this function. Redefine unique. So here's the code. This guy right here. First, we're going to kick it off with a self-executing anonymous function where we alias jQuery as dollar. Standard stuff. <clears throat> now, we're going to save an old version of jQuery.unique. So we're just going to cache that kind of locally here. Then, we're going to redefine jQuery unique. <clears throat> New definition. Still takes in an array. If you pass in an array and the first, um, the first thing in it is an element, then we're just going to do the old thing. So like, no big deal. If you pass in elements, we'll do the same old thing. However, in every other case, we're going to do the, 
the badass stuff here. So uh, we're basically going to use grep and in array methods you might not use every day. Uh, and suffice it to say that this combo reduces the duplicates. Yeah, it does. Trust me. <clears throat> so here we are using it. So we got array with like strings, booleans, numbers, whatever. We run unique on it and it dedupes it. Same thing with numbers. But out. Duck punching. Sweet. We could also, this thing before that I showed you, or that I didn't show you, I said we would get to it later. We were talking about passing in window and document and undefined and how that's all cool and stuff. Now, I was thinking, you know, we always do this, this function, we pass a function into to jQuery and like this is the document ready thing, right? And um, so also you'll see something like this where we use jQuery there and we use dollar there. Cool. And I was like, what if we then had window and document and undefined here? Wouldn't that be cool? It would be. So here we are. <clears throat> we basically take the old, uh, take the ready method as it's defined now. Now we have the old ready. Uh, we're going to redefine it. And basically for every function, we're going to adjust um, the, uh, well, the method signature in a way. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to be changing what gets passed in on the fly for everything that gets tossed into it. So basically, um, this little guy enables uh, this use right here. It's pretty cool, you know, for trained professionals only, but you can do it. I want to make a quick note on delay. <coughs> delay only by default it only works in the um, in the FX queue what do I mean here we go uh, there's a number of different you can jQuery has queuing mechanisms um, and by default all of animation stuff happens in the FX queue but you could use another queue um, what this means is that it only work if something's queued. So if like you want something to fade in or fade out after two seconds, this will not work. There's no queue already existing there. Um, that's why it has to basically have a queue already enabled um, in there. Otherwise, you're basically uh, gonna have to use the queue methods to do something like that. <clears throat> FYI. And we're gonna skip that. Support, just cool. I like this a lot. It's not support. I'm not even hungry. Don't even know why that's appropriate. <clears throat> Okay, I just like this technique. I think this is really rad. Um, basically, we have all these tests, right? jQuery support has um, has all these things inside of it. It basically tells you what's going on, what kind of browser bugs are we dealing with, and um, and here's the cool part. It creates this div, right? And in that div, it puts all this HTML. It puts this white space here, this like weird slash A in the href, and then opacity of 0.55, and then, uh, it's weird. <clears throat> Anyways, and now has this div. And, um, and all these tests, like, use the same div. So we're checking this thing with T-body, this T-body bug, and we look inside that div and we, then we check the serialization and we check something going on with that div. And so basically we have this one like totally potentially messed up thing. I mean, it gets really messed up in IE and everyone else is fine. It gets totally messed up. And then all these tests basically test what part of the messed upness it is. And then, um, returns like a Boolean. Yeah, it's really sweet. I just, it's a fascinating technique. I just want to like review 
how excuse me how jQuery um, uh, exists in development. If you go to the GitHub page and you go to look actually at the code, you won't find the the script file that we're all used to. You won't find this guy. He's not anywhere. What you will find is a bunch of these little modules. And so attributes and data and dimensions all have their own little modules. Um, and that means that, well, it's, it's just nicer. So the way that they basically get put together, we can look at the make file and, and dig into that. Here they all are. These are all the modules. And um, when they're constructed, there's an intro and an outro and then these base files, which is everything here, all these modules. The intro is this guy, top comment and the beginning of the closure. And the outro is the end of the closure. And that's about it. Um, now the cool thing that we can realize <coughs> by looking at this is that because the um, jQuery source is constructed from the modules in this order. You now know that um, what the dependency direction is, right? So dimensions um, depends on some portion of these files in front of it. Where, however, support does not depend at all on dimensions, right? So hypothetically. <clears throat> You could, if you wanted to reduce the size of your jQuery, this is a bad idea. This is, anyways, you could just get rid of the dimensions, and then you could get rid of offset if you didn't need this, if you didn't need these, uh, these methods, and then effects because you know that nothing above it depends on anything beneath it. I mean, I think this would work. I'm pretty, sure, maybe. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably very wrong. <clears throat> Don't know why. All right. My big recommendation, however, is this. Bitly slash JQ source. I want you guys to type this into your browser right now. I already did it. <clears throat> We're going to do it again. Bitly JQ source. Bitly JQ source is the latest jQuery source in full unminified glory. It's fantastic. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to drag it to your bookmarks bar. You're going to name it something awesome like jQuery source faux life forever. Because <clears throat> you can just refer to this whenever you want. It's as good as the documentation. I mean, it's professional level documentation um, but it's really just good to, to refer to and you learn techniques and you learn how it works please do that otherwise thanks for watching um, please if you have any questions anything that I, I went too fast over or whatever um, just leave a comment and um, and we'll definitely get it figured out for you so anyways thank you very much